about 50 years ago, when I first came back from India as a kid, before I met Rudy, about a week or two before I met Rudy, I was staying at a friend's loft in Soho and sleeping on their couch, as I recall, his, his and his girlfriend. And I picked up a copy of Esquire magazine and I read an article <coughs> basically by a group, I think it was called the Club of Rome, talking about how we were going to run out of food on this planet and there were going to be too many people and presented an unbelievably dire picture of the world. And I don't know what happened exactly. But I know I had come back from India having not found a teacher, which was a big deal for me. And I was um, totally uncertain of the future. I had no path forward. I was probably in many ways depleted and I remember I was very scared. And reading that article didn't help. And something flipped in me as I finished it and I couldn't move and I sat still in on that couch and I I was immobile and in truth I remained immobile for about two or three days and my friend didn't know what to make of what was happening and I didn't know what to make of what was happening and nobody knew what to do. He would keep saying, are you okay? Do you need anything? I would go. I just couldn't function. It was really pretty scary. And it was the kind of thing where I think he might have called a doctor after another 24 hours had I sat there any longer, but something strange happened. And it was very instructive. He, um, was rebuilding the loft and a huge delivery of, uh, of wood arrived down three flights of stairs and it all needed to be brought upstairs. And he came to me and he said, Bruce, I don't know what's going on with you, but I need help. Can you help me bring this plywood, two by fours, everything up the stairs? And I, I mean, I just was so out of it, but I said, okay. And I walked downstairs and I started lugging lumber up the stairs, one piece after another. And it was unbelievably exhausting, really difficult. And the thing that happened, and I've never forgotten this, is that somewhere by about the third or fourth trip up the floor, up the stairs, I discovered whatever was happening to me was lifting. This depression, this nihilism, this darkness was just lifting. And everything I did, every trip I made, I got lighter and lighter and lighter. And I understood in the deepest part of my being <clears throat> that the salvation for my depression and my lack of direction and clarity was move, move, work. Movement and work were crucial, crucial ingredients. By the time I had gotten all the wood upstairs, I was a different person. I had let go of all of the darkness. I had no idea how to proceed, but I didn't care. I was trusting life. I was full. I was energized. I was through something that really had to go, th I had to go through, which I didn't in any way understand or grasp, but it was essential. And what took place was that I got freed from my inertia by movement, by action, by taking direction, by helping somebody do something. All of these tiny little ingredients saved me. And as the story goes, about a week or two later, I met Rudy, I met Blanche, and my life turned around. So there's a directive here. One of those directives is, 
something I read a long time ago, which I've always loved, and I've said it in teaching many times, I think, God loves those who are in motion. We need to engage our lives, we need to engage the world, we need to engage the demands that life makes on us, and we need to make demands and engage ourselves. It's not just a matter of passivity. This idea of still-pointedness, which is at the core of our meditation experience, must be balanced by the doing and the action in the world. They are part of a whole, of a continuum. And sitting still alone in a retreat or a meditation facility or somewhere where you are just separating from the world is fine if you want to learn about how to sit still, but it's not the place to spend the rest of your life. Perhaps, maybe there are people for whom that is the only way. But I have met many, many people who have gone inward as a place of hiding, as a way of leaving the world behind, as a way of simply staying inside and not engaging. I, I don't want to be judgmental because that may be the path for many people. But I have experienced, I remember one particular woman recently who came to class who had been a meditator and in retreat for many, many years. I don't know why she had come out exactly. But she was one of the deepest people I'd ever seen. But when I went to hug her, she totally froze. She was unable to connect. She was able to go in, but not out. This to me is wildly imbalanced, problematic. <clears throat> Just going outward is also terribly imbalanced. And most people that you know in life, and you may be one of them, are mostly outer driven. We look to the world to take care of us, to keep us engaged, to keep us in motion, to keep us alive, to keep us stimulated, to keep us distracted, to keep us involved. And we can get so involved that we forget the basic tenet of the Buddhist teaching, which is impermanence. Which means you can have all of this stuff, but it's not going to last. It's all fine. Enjoy it. Enjoy it while you have it. But don't look to it for anything other than the joy of the moment, I guess. But do be aware that everything that is your source of uh, involvement and pleasure in the moment is going to go away. It's impermanent. It cannot last. Everything you seek from the outside is a failed uh, salvation. You cannot be saved by the outer. It can't happen. Because if you're attached to it, you're going to be saddened or grief-stricken or beyond that, paralyzed in depression by the loss of everything outside you. The alternative to that is this inward journey, which can also become, in its own funny way, paralytic. So what's this razor's edge of activity? It's the thing that I found when I met Rudy. He said, your material life is your spiritual life. And that just connected. It connected. It was so meaningful to me. It was so valuable. This is it. Not that or that. This. This is it. And it's so extraordinarily necessary to finally arrive at this. And I kept trying through my meditative practice with Rudy of taking my deep breaths and asking for help to surrender and really going deep into my chakra system. I kept trying to get to this. But the problem was the trying. Because trying implies that you're not this or that you're not here. And of course you're here. And all you have to do is go, oh, and this funny thing happens when you go, oh, you go, ah, oh, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. I'm here. And that here is a really interesting place because it is the seed form of everything. But when I was sitting on that couch 
in a state of total depression. In a sense, I was here, because I, I, I had no future I could contemplate. Past was just sort of evaporating. All I could face was this dark future that seemed to be arising around me or would have something to do with where I would finally end up in this world. And it was so not uh, exciting, compelling, uh, involving that I just, I didn't want to go there. I only wanted to be hidden in a sense, hidden from the future, hidden from life. And so I got into a present tense that was awful, awful. There is this idea in spirituality that by being in the moment, you will enter into infinite bliss and transformation. You will find liberation and that your journey will be over by just being in the present. But just being in the present isn't enough. Just being in the present can be a state of terrible stuckness, of sadness, of depletion, of depression. There's something else that's wanted in this whole journey. And I guess the, the word that I like most about it, well, there's two of them. One is aliveness, alive in the present. And the other is presence, that you are present. And what you discover is that there is, in a sense, a you, which is known as the ego-minded personal self, which in the present tense can get stuck, can get depressed, can get lost. And there is the being that you are, which is nothing but the present tense. And it is nothing but presence. And it is infinite, vast, eternal being. The difference between sitting in the present as a you, as an ego, and being present as the self is a deep difference. It's profound. The journey that we are all on is to find that profound truth that we are. Sitting in that space of egotistical, me terrified of the world, or me the best thing that ever happened to the world, or whatever your particular configuration is, is a false state. In other words, it is not permanent. It is uh, not going to provide you with anything at all other than a temporary sense of misery or joy. And holding on to it is going to cause you to suffer. Nothing new here. These are ancient teachings. What to do? What to do? Rudy said, take a breath, go into your heart, ask for help to surrender. Surrender what? Surrender this personhood that is causing you grief. This person who is building a life on quicksand. This person who thinks they're going to get something if they get you know, if they make $2 billion and they build this incredible mansion in Mar Largo or wherever, wherever you think your mansion should be, that you get the yacht that you've been waiting for your whole life. I just read there was some yacht docking in Florida that was a $2 billion <laughs> yacht. I don't know what you do with a $2 billion <laughs> yacht. But you get all that stuff. You get all that stuff and then what? You think it gives you permanence? You think it gives you ultimate joy and pleasure? I remember talking to people who were Hollywood people who were on a studio head's yacht and they said they would have given anything to be close enough to shore to jump in and swim. They wanted off of that yacht. They said it was the most unbearable, luxurious misery that they could possibly imagine because these people were so egocentric, so driven, so, so about themselves and only wanted to be honored and acknowledged on their yacht. And I get it. I've been around enough of the luxurious parts of life to know how illusionary they all are. It's, it's delusionary. <clears throat> what you want is to find the self that permeates all of this and doesn't go anywhere, that offers, <clears throat> excuse me, a kind of well-being, a kind of joy, a kind of simplicity, a kind of 
satisfaction and fulfillment that requires nothing but itself to be. Nothing. Requires nothing. It's not an escape from the world. It's not embracing the world. It's in this place that envelops all of that. It's a singularity. It's a oneness. It's a totality. It is the absolute. And it is what and who you are. It's what you are. This is not, I'm not, I know it sounds like words, and I know it sounds like pontificating about something that maybe one day you'll get to. I'm telling you, you are that as we speak. Not to know that is because you are addicted to what is not true, what is false. You are addicted to the drama. And I completely get it. I have been addicted to the drama, and I still get swept into the drama. We all get swept into it because it's so pervasive. But what you need is either a meditative life that pulls you back for half an hour into a place of, oh yeah, this, oh, and a feeling of gratitude and relief that you've escaped the stupidity of your own delusions, or you start to arrive at a place of presence and you watch all of these things form inside you, happiness, sadness, drama, everything, and you just watch it with amazement. You watch it. You go, oh my God, this is a dark day. Wow, this is beautiful. This is terrifying. This is wonderful. You see all of these things forming inside and you acknowledge them and you are with them and you understand they are part of some kind of, the, the old image, clouds filling the sky and blotting out the sun. It's temporary. Don't suddenly shoot yourself in the head because the, the, sun, the sun got obstructed. It's not like that. The thing is, go deep inside and find a way to say yes to the what is, no matter how it presents itself. And it will present itself in every kind of form imaginable, and it's waiting to see what form can you not get away from. What form captures you? What form catches you? And we all, we're all, we know what they are. We all have certain things that get us every time, every time. And finally, you have to go, I'm done with that. No. And you just relax. You just relax. Or you go, okay, okay, I get it. Okay, there you are again. I'm, I get it. And you just, you say, you accept and you accept and you open and you open and you become liberated more and more deeply than you ever imagined was possible. That's the spiritual journey. That's what sitting every day does. That's what opening does. That's what awakening allows to take place. It is an exquisite journey and it's valuable. <clears throat> Having said all that, <laughs> this morning I was reading the New York Times before I taught class and probably not a wise thing to do, but it's often very informative and valuable in its own funny way. And there was an article about somebody talking about 25 years ago, I think it was, reading an article by all of these scientists who said, we only have so much time left on this planet if we don't take care of business. And it was like totally invoking for me again, this 50 year old moment of sitting there and going, oh my God, it's all gonna end or it's gonna get terrible or we're all gonna starve. And, and then we didn't know about climate change exactly, or if we did, we weren't talking about it. We didn't know about Donald Trump. We didn't know about all of these things that can go on in the world, political, problems. I mean, we did, but, you know, we all have our ways of living in our own particular confirmation of things. You know, I'll buy with this part. I don't want to play a part of that. You know, we all, we all live in a life we design, basically. We all, we all create the universe we want to be in. So anyway, I took this in today. I took it in. I said, it was, it was scary because I've been, you know, we've all been, those of you who read the newspaper, who listen to fake news, <laughs> Uh, we, we've all we've all started hearing scientists talk about the fact that there's problem with bees, there's problems with uh, the, the bees disappearing now, huge numbers of insects disappearing. They take care of pollinating the flowers. They make the food chain possible. Those of you who um, watch the news learned learned about what happened in Puerto Rico and in, in Houston, um, in Florida. You know, I'm a dramatist. You know, I come from a, the realm of drama. We have something called foreshadowing in drama. In the first act, if somebody coughs, you know they're going to die in the third act. <laughs> That's just how it works. That's what it's called. 
And if you're on this planet right now and you take a look at Puerto Rico and you take a look at Florida and you take a look at Houston and, and you know, we live uh, 30 miles from the fires up north that, you know, destroyed a whole community. You know, you look at all of this stuff and it's called foreshadowing. It's a sign of things to come. Those of you who were here in Los Angeles during the summer had temperatures of 110 above. Even in San Rafael up north, we had 110. That's not normal. That doesn't happen. This stuff is now happening. And it's happening in a very big way. And it is both foreshadowing and also not foreshadowing. It is the arrival of the possibility of an uninhabitable planet. Some of us have grandchildren who are going to be living on that planet. And also some of us are beginning to realize that it's happening so fast we're going to be living on that planet. So it's not like for some future generation, it's for us. Things are changing in a very dramatic way and they're not being addressed. If anything, they're being hidden. You know, well, hidden is the wrong word there. We're, it's climate change, as we're told by some people, is, 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 is um, a fiction. Uh, other people tell us it's not, and we're in a society that's actually even debating those kind of things when the temperature is 110 in San Rafael, and when, you know, a whole country is washed away. And it's really interesting, those of us who watch the news as opposed to just read about it, will find that Puerto Rico, as an example, uh, a country that was pretty much demolished by a storm created by global warming, really, it's approximately, for a week or two, maybe four minutes of the news broadcast. Then it's a minute, then it's a 30 second piece, and then it just disappears. Do you think the people of Puerto Rico have gotten over the hurricane because it's no longer on the newscast? And yet our minds are over it. We don't think about it. You know, it's gone. The fires are gone, the, the floods are gone, hurricanes are gone until the next news cycle. I don't want to get political here. All I want to say is this. The thing that put me in a state of great trauma 50 years ago is now expanding and uh, filling the airwaves. We can still push it away, but it's going to come closer and closer day by day. And we have to live with this. And in a way, we are powerless to do much about it. And this is important because what does one do in the face of such huge, dramatic odds? What do you do? Of course, you can sign petitions, you can give money, you can go picket, you can walk, you know, and on the streets and try to you know, tell people what's going on. Blanche and I went on a, you know, on a climate change march up in San Rafael. I mm -hmm. talked about it. It was just a lot of angry people mm -hmm. being angry. And I felt no con contribution to the, the larger uh, mm -hmm. world situation. Those of us who are concerned about the world and about ourselves and about our loved ones, there's not a lot of doing that will be effective. You may find things you can do, and I would say, great, engage them, do them. But here's a really important and I think interesting idea. Being is a verb. Being is a verb. It's not a passive experience. Being is an active experience. It is something not that you do, it is something that is happening. When you engage being, you are, in a sense, affecting and changing everything around you. People who are being, in an egoistic sense, are affecting things often in very karmic ways. They'll, they'll, they'll lash out, they'll do something negative, it will come back in some way to haunt them. Uh, the problem with egoistic being is that it is self-serving. It is for your, per for your benefit and nobody else's, usually. True being is infinite and eternal being, and it is the larger context in which your little tiny being exists. 
if you can get rid of your little tiny being a little bit, just begin to break it down, just open inside to this larger being, the verb of that, the activity of that, will be a state of presence, of being that affects everyone and everything around you. Your being is the very antidote to the stuff that's happening. Yes, you can pick it. Yes, you can do all these kinds of material things if you want, but nothing will be more effective than learning how, which is not really the right word because learning is not exactly how you arrive at this, but coming to the place of just being yourself. What I see happen when you are you, when you're just being, the doing aspect of being affects everything in every minor, minuscule way, at minuscule ways. And I've talked about this, you know, because I, I go on my walks every day and now I see litter on the side of the road and I go, well, <laughs> I can walk by it or I can pick it up. If it's a garbage day, I don't, have, I don't hesitate. I pick it up and walk 20 steps and I'll drop the, the, the beer can in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a garbage pail somewhere. But sometimes I, if you pick stuff up, you gotta carry it for quite a while. And, and I keep going in this thing that Rudy taught me. He used to say, if it's in front of you, it's yours. You can not look at it. You can just say somebody else will get it. The garbage guys will come by, but those garbage guys aren't gonna jump out of the car to pick up a beer can. It's gonna sit on the side of the road for years. So my understanding is I can do this. I can pick it up. I know it's tiny. I know it's ridiculous. Who cares? Nobody cares. I care. I care. I care because if it's in front of me, it's mine. If there are people in front of me who need something and I can provide it, it's mine. I have to do it. You have to do it. You can be selective. There are the same people standing on the same corners in San Rafael asking for money every day and I do not give them money every day because they are not engaging their capacity to do. I'm sorry, I don't mean to put them down. I'm not against welfare. I'm just trying to say that sitting on the corner is not the only answer, and there are people who you do not help by giving them stuff. But there are people, and your mind and your ego and your something inside you will tell you, this person needs this. That's when you give. Do the thing that's in front of you. Help the person in front of you. Bring them into your home. Bring them, give them a meal. Whatever, whatever it is, let your being be the action that helps the world. That is a wonderful spiritual reality. That who you are, in a way, is a loving, giving, compassionate being, but don't put boundaries on that. Let it ripple. Let it go out. Be the best version of your ego-minded, tiny self and be the expression of vastness and infinity that is behind that ego being. That is the best activity you can possibly bring into what's happening here. The world may be in for a very difficult ride. I suspect it is. S something needs to show light in the middle of darkness. Something needs to be light in the middle of darkness. You are the light. You are the light. If you're sitting there going, but, I'm sorry, you're wrong. You are the light. As hard as it is to be the light, as hard as it is to be a kind, compassionate, loving human being, you are that if you choose to be that. You are that if you wish to engage it, or if you get out of the way of the thing that fights that idea. Don't sit back and say, oh, but he's not talking to me. I've got all, I've got all these problems and all these issues and all, these, you know, all that stuff, or I'm too busy, or I've got my life to live, or I've all these dramas going on in my life. Yes, every human being has all of that going on. On the other hand, you are either an ego-minded, tightly uh, wound up person living in that world, or you are a beam of light moving through it. 
I will tell you, you are the beam of light. If you believe me, you'll live differently. If you don't believe me, you'll keep fighting and go through your day-to-day -day bullshit as though it's important. Uh, I, I can only tell you that bringing yourself to the table of this meditative process of sitting still every day long enough to just touch yourself, to touch the light, to touch the thing in you that's waiting to be expressed, to find the path in you that opens the door to the flood of light that wants to shoot through you. If you can do that every day and just take responsibility for that every day, your life will be changed and the world will be changed. I cannot tell you how it will be changed. I think I've described this before, but you know, I, one of the things I was told by the universe was tell people what you saw, which was a relationship to my LSD trip in the 60s, but beyond that to, to this awareness of what everything I'm talking about right now. I was told to share it and it gave me a platform which was to make movies. And every so often people come to me and tell me that my movie changed their life. I, I You know, it's like I don't know what I put out, what it will do. I have no idea that it will serve other people. You don't know this stuff, but you just put it out. It doesn't have to be a movie. It could just be an act of kindness. You, I mean, the, the, the cliche of that is so ridiculous, but pay it forward. That idea is so valuable to people. If you can give this thing to the world, it will maybe one day come back to you and someone will say, you know, you really helped me. But if they never say it, and that, trust me, it doesn't matter, you, won't, it, you will feel the joy of having been a transmitter rather than a obstructor. You will feel the joy of this thing pouring through you. When light pours through you, who's the first person to experience the light? You are. You're the light. And that light will completely wash away all of the stuff inside you. It'll wash away everything. The more you give it, the more it cleanses, the more it expands, the more it shines through, and people will find you to look for light. They will come to you to look for light. So, I guess if there's a core message, one, the world needs you, two, you're exactly what you need to be to help. There's this extraordinary quality of being that equates with doing. If you can use being as a verb, you can affect everything in the world around you without having to literally do very much. You just do by being and the being will take care of it. The being is all you need to engage. Be yourself in the deepest, most profound, most loving, most complete way that you can figure out. And when you stop trying, really, it will happen. Trying is fine, but when you just let it be, let it be, you will arrive at the thing you've been seeking your whole life, which is where you've always been. Okay. Any questions? Absolutely. That's exactly right. You know, and we're all living in a state of grace. We're just not, we're not um, embodying it very well. You know, I mean, most of us, most of us, um, if we have pain, curse the world, curse it, want relief immediately, want, it's not a big, we don't know, we don't need to know the origin of it so much. We just want to get rid of it. But pain is a, pain speaks to us, you know, and and we have to dialogue with the white with the what is. We have to dialogue with it. And I've discovered in certain cases that the universe provides pain to bring me to it. 
not to the pain, but to the universe itself. Only through the pain do I dig deep enough sometimes to get to the truth of my being. So it's not it's it's not a punishment. You know, I mean, it's hard to describe what this is. I mean, to put it into words is beyond almost everybody's ability. A few poets like Rumi get there. Mostly, we we crawl along trying to figure it out a little bit. Some people don't even try to figure it out. They just crawl along. But we're really, we're trying, we're trying to make ourselves at one with an enormous mystery. And that mystery will never be understood, but it will be felt, and it will be known, and it will be embraced, and you will come to a place inside yourself that is nothing but grateful. And I can't explain it beyond that, but that's the ride. And if you're not walking around grateful, and if you're not walking around in a state of amazement and wonder, you're not there yet. I, 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 I keep trying to describe the walks I take every day, but when you can walk around and want to just hug literally everything and everyone, and touch the flower petals and feel your feet on the ground and feel tensions moving out of the soles of your feet as you walk and feel the air touching you and the beauty of everything around you just announcing itself. And there are layers of color and levels of, of perception that I never knew were there before and they are just radiating, radiating all day long. I try to take pictures of it to give you, to give people a sense of what I'm seeing. It's, it's so, unbelievably beautiful and wonderful and horrible and difficult and problematic the whole spectrum but but you get to go wow to the entirety rather than I'll take this part not that part that's where you get in trouble Todd. going from that personal pain alchemy transformation to the more global there seems to be a bit of a disconnect from going and understanding that personal thing to really seeing what's real. But it seems like there's more of a negative foreshadowing around the larger picture of our, not I wouldn't call it an impending doom, but whatever it is that it seems um, you're thinking. I'm just wondering where the two interplay. So it seems like it's pretty easy from the individual to like alchemize this physical pain into seeing it as God's love, but it seems a little harder to do when there's other people involved? None of it's easy, exactly. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know that it's alchemizing either, exactly. I think that pain brings you to a doorway of helplessness. That's all I can tell you. And out of that helplessness, you may actually ask in a way that is truly sincere, and something comes. That's my experience of it. Um, having it happen in a global sense is a deepening of that. For me, my personal pain I can deal with. When I look at my grandchildren crying, I am brokenhearted beyond belief. I, I, the pain, my empathy for them is beyond anything I've ever known before. And now my empathy is, is becoming more universal. So I walk around with a broken heart much of the time. But it doesn't stop the beauty and the wonder from radiating everywhere. I think the core ingredient in all of this is a broken-heartedness. But as Leonard Cohen and others, Rumi, have said, it's through the broken hearts, the cracks, that the light comes through. So we have to let the light through in any way we can get there. I don't understand the construction of all of this. I don't like the fact that the world might actually be in trouble. That really is beyond description, and I don't know what to do other than talk about it and to arrive at understandings. and. The understandings that I'm arriving at are pretty much what I'm presenting in the class. They just have to do with this, the verbalizing, the verb, the making of a verb of being. You know, that's really important to me. And this is a journey we're all undertaking personally, individually, and globally, and, you, and collectively. So we're, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that is beyond um, individual ideas and, and abilities to handle. Although some people may be in a position to move the world more strongly than others, each one of us can do our part. And that's all, that's all we can do. The pain of global suffering or of suffering beyond ourselves is our pain. We're not separate from it at all. 
And I gave a talk last week completely about my grandson not wanting his father to go to a business meeting. And, and he broke down crying in a way that I, I, I that was, the, it was me crying. I mean, I, I was crying to, to God, you know, I was, I was crying because I felt how alone we all are, how frightened we all are, how dependent we all are, how interdependent we are. It was all there and that crying was so pure. It was so frightened and so reaching out and attached and hopeful and I get it. And I am that being, I am that, I am all of that. And it's only by expressing it as totally as we can that we begin to reach out to each other and find this connectivity that is our salvation in a sense. But, it, the, but the true salvation is not the reaching out and touching each other as much as it is reaching in and touching ourself. And they both are essential to me. And I don't know if that's answering your question, but it really is what I feel. The alchemy is essentially being driven to find that space in yourself that is connected to all that is. That's what we need to do. And once you do that, you realize the connection is you and it, dissolves into one thing, which is all we are, which is the absolute. Carol? Yeah, um, when you spoke about the joy you feel walking in the morning, this, I had made a commitment, because um, I know I can now, to change and shift how I walk through life. I've been the tough New York broad, and <clears throat> it got me thing, but it didn't open my heart. Um, so in the past year or so, I, between everything, I've, I've become a person that wants to shift me. I, um, I decided I want to have joy wherever I can and make something good out of it. I had my car stolen last week and that was devastating for me. And then I received a phone call four days later that a policeman said, hi, I, I found your car just now. If you can get here in half an hour, I don't have to impound it. So everything worked out that somebody was giving me a lift and I got there. And I met this terrific human being who took the time to not impound my car, who had about him the, the loveliest quality, and I said to him, can I hug you? Can I, can, well, I am so grateful to you. Can I take your picture and put it on Facebook? And we all laughed. I mean, this was really a big deal to me. I had lost my purse and my everything. Uh, and this joyful moment came about. I put it on Facebook. I put his photo on, and I said, "This, I love this man, but whatever I said about it, People kept writing to me. Their hearts were opening towards policemen, towards how good people could be. I, I am not telling this because look what a fabulous person I am. I'm saying what a result out, out, of, out of wanting to be some other kind of person in the worst possible time. And then I, oh, and then I printed an 11 by 17. I printed it out and I, 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 typed, I put the type differently and all and I made an 11 by 17 poster and I brought it into the police station. And he was, he was not there, but they talked about how they're going to tease him. <laughs> and I walked out and I went, okay, I, I, and, and my $300 glasses were still in the car. So, <laughs> wow. so I just need to tell wow. that story. Well, thank you. No, so I mean, <laughs> I think it just amplifies what I'm talking about, but also not everybody here knows you. The journey to this person that you're talking I'm about that. is such an exquisite, <laughs> it's an exquisite journey. And that's really what I'm trying to talk about. We all have that possibility in ourselves. We all, we all have something in us that elevates us if we want to be elevated and allows us to contribute to the world in a way that is loving and grateful. It's a beautiful journey. And if you're not there, it's only because you choose not to be there or you're too self-absorbed not to want to bother. But I would suggest bother. It's worth it. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you guys for coming.